Good evening, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Yvette. I um, lead marketing and event production at Next Gen Chef. Uh, very passionate about innovative food tech, uh, which is uh, why I joined this amazing team. Um, I'm here with Justine and Rochelle. Uh, hi, team. Uh, you're a group of um, wonderful ladies who want to connect people with each other, bring education and innovation. Um, we have been impacted by COVID-19, um, but we are keeping it nimble. Uh, and eventually we made this event online and we want to provide the same um, kind of human interaction and connection given all the limitations. So thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's so good to see your lovely faces. Uh, and thank you for being part of our community. Today, uh, our panel is going to be two parts. The first part will touch on how accessible healthy food is to the masses today. Uh, and then we'll have a short break uh, led by our certified yoga instructor, Rochelle. And then following uh, that quick yoga session, um, if you can see on uh, this program flyer, we will have uh, a Q&A where everyone will be put into breakout rooms um, and have an in intimate networking session uh, and having Q&A if you um, have particular questions to ask uh, our um, panelists. Then we'll reconvene here in the main room at seven o'clock and continue to talk about the elephant in the room, how COVID-19 is impacting food businesses as well as individuals. Then hopefully we'll wrap up at around 7.30 uh, and then uh, to continue the rest of your evening. Now, I would like to uh, present to you our panelists today. Um, we have Zuleika Strassner, who is the CEO and founder of ZeroShop.co, as well as Rob Eisenbach, who is the founder of Iron River Branding. Um, would you two like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I can go first. Thank you so much, Yvette, for hosting this and Next Gen Chef. Hello to everybody. I hope everybody is keeping well. My name is Zaleka, as you heard. I'm the founder and CEO of Zero. You can find us at zeroshop.co, not .com. All the cool kids live at .co these days. <laughs> um, I founded the company um, in 2019. We are the very first plastic-free online grocery store. Um, serving next day delivery of over 350 items that are completely plastic free. Um, as you can probably hear, I'm from England originally. I grew up in London. Um, I studied politics at Oxford. I had a career in politics in the UK. Um, and following that, I worked in ed tech and then in VC. And now I am the founder of my very own online grocery delivery service. Fantastic. Um, Rob, uh, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Absolutely. Sorry about the technical difficulties on my part. I finally figured it out. Seems that any time I use my, my AirPods with a Zoom, it, it like works maybe 60% of the time. Anyway, um, I'm Rob Eisenbach. I'm the founder of Iron River. We're a consultancy focused on mission-driven companies in food, fitness, health and wellness, nutrition, et cetera. Pretty much um, any company that aligns with my mission to improve the health of people and planet. Um, my background is in consumer products uh, for roughly 15 years, um, in and out of food companies. Um, specific food experience was at uh, Nabisco to Spunkmeyer, um, and then a bunch of clients through my roles, um, both now and in previous consulting um, uh, firms. Um, excited to be here um, and looking forward to this topic. Amazing. Um, today, we, all, we were also expecting Megan from a bike technology, but uh, as we all understand, work from home is hard and it's harder to work from home as well as parents at the same time. So that's, um, that, 
uh, that's what happened to Megan today. Uh, she's a proud mother of three. Uh, and then even though we miss her, but um, um, we, we, we understand it's hard to parent uh, and then have all this going on at the same time. Um, but uh, we will start with our first question to the panelists. The, the concept of um, healthy food accessibility is becoming a buzzword. Everyone's using it. It's in policy reports, uh, international summits, as well as smartphone apps. But what exactly does that mean? Uh, would you share your interpretation of uh, food accessibility? Zulika, do you want to take this one? It's really not my expertise. I'm, I'm happy to give my definition. Um, so I'll give my definition. I'm, on, I'm, I'm holding my space bar. Um, to me, it's not just uh, you know, food within reach or it's affordable. I think, I think those are the first two things that come to my mind. But it's also, is, is the knowledge accessible? Because I feel like there's just a gap in knowing what to eat, what's healthy for you, how, how to eat it, how to prepare certain foods, really. Um, and even like how much you should pay for them and why it's important. And if, without that information, it's hard to make them a priority in your life. So that's, that's my thought. Suleika, so you're, you're on mute. I'm unmuted. Um, I have to also just talk about this uh, question of food accessibility. Um, it's interesting, I, I agree with um, what Rob is saying, and you know, the internet in particular has changed that around the democratization of knowledge and the ability to include, you know, myself and my friends to learn about different foods. I think accessibility for me is related in particular to um, price point and then actually being able to physically access those foods. I think when I came to this industry, you know, I grew up in, in London. Uh, my family didn't have a lot growing up and we were very conscious of what we were able to put on the table. And a lot of that was around the ability to afford certain foods. And in particular, when we look at organic produce and at zero, we, we sell predominantly organic produce and we're about 10 to 15 percent cheaper than um, you know, other, other brick and mortar stores and other online grocery stores. It's how do you make good quality food, organic food, healthy food, a wide array of food, also foods that are specific to certain populations, certain ethnicities, certain groups. Um, to be able to access those foods at a lower price point is absolutely key. So we don't create some type of food bourgeoisie that exists. And then the second um, is really around physically getting those products. So when we look at food deserts in this country, in particular, we have huge swathes of this country um, who oftentimes can be up to 100 miles away from organic food or a range of organic food, let alone accessible organic produce or organic produce that is within their, their budget. So the question is, how do you get millions of Americans access to foods that maybe are only available to a small sub portion? And how do you democratize healthcare and how do you democratize wellness and good eating? That's a very comprehensive overview. Uh, thank you, Rob and Zuleika. Uh, absolutely. Uh, brilliant point on the um, uh, the dual prone uh, approach to tackling accessibility of food. So it's absolutely price and physical access. Uh, I think Rob also mentioned um, uh, education, which is pretty interesting um, because um, I think there uh, is the aspect of cultural approach, uh, appreciation as well. So um, depending on what uh, community you come from, um, nutritious foods, uh, can mean different things to you, um, or people don't have the access um, to uh, of knowledge um, to to understand what's good for their bodies. Um, and um, following Zuleika's point on food deserts, I think it's a good segue into our next question: What are the biggest things in food tech right now that's disrupting the landscape of food accessibility? Um, and uh, would you like to? share uh, this very relevant question in how food, how tech is Im impacting grocery uh, deliveries and how that is uh, changing food accessibility for everyone. That's to me again. Yeah, Zuleika, you want to take yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it's so hard to know who's going to answer. Like, I want to hear from everybody else too. Um, you know, I think tech really is the the key to a lot of this because we exist right now with near no technologies oftentimes in what we call the supply chain or at times um, some legacy technology that if it inherently makes a lot of these processes more expensive or inherently makes these processes a lot more cumbersome than they need to be. Um, here at Zero, when we came to kind of building uh, what is a grocery store in, in 2020, very differently from how online grocery stores were built just seven or 10 years ago, we were very mindful of technologies that impact um, the product end to end. So by that, we mean how product is both manufactured and then and sourced and packed and how it moves through the supply chain in particular. And how do you build overarching technologies that are far more connected, not just technologies that are around, you know, routing drivers in a particular way or just simply optimizing um, efficiencies of how somebody can, how quickly somebody can pull from the shelves of Whole Foods or Safeway, for example. And we've seen technologies change through this period to where now we see ourselves much more as a tech-enabled grocery store as opposed to what we had seen in the last 10 years, which was a distancing from tech companies from the actual grocery piece of what they were doing to say, we are simply a logistics infrastructure. So they had very little connection to the actual food or to the farmers or the manufacturers or the producers. So we set out on a mission to ensure that our tech plugs into all parts of that supply chain. And for us, that was integral because how do you get, let alone 350 things, how do you get 50 things or 100 things plastic free out to the masses? And we found very, very quickly that the existing systems didn't work for us. And then there was a need for technologies to enable those things to happen. So when you work with a producer or a manufacturer, people often think that manufacturers don't have these intentions, intentions to either be more sustainable or intentions for more technology. The truth is they do. Um, they just need to be presented with solutions and partners that can fit in with what they're currently doing. And we found that as we can build out those solutions and those technologies, we can bring about the change in sustainability in particular in, in our use case. That's very interesting um, because uh, in our uh, conversation, previous conversation, um, I i uh, like to share with everyone that uh, Zuleika mentioned the availability of big data and how that impacts um, the food space um, because businesses now can optimize efficiency as well as reduce plastic. I think that is so important in solving this dilemma. How do you make good, nutri good organic nutritious food cheaper, which is uh, the value proposition of zero from my understanding. Um, and with, because you can um, reduce uh, redundant processes and optimize the supply chain, um, you can uh, help that to bring down the cost uh, and then lower the price for the consumers. Would you say that? A big, yeah, a big part of that is the democratization of that data in the very first place. So how do you enable both a farmer and a large CPG company and a small sale, a, a smaller size or a mid-size you know, granola producer, for example, to get data that they've never really had before, rich data around the types of demographics that are using their and, and consuming their products. Not only maybe their products, but other products that are similar to their products. Um, how, 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 how much more quickly can you get their product to market? And how much more quickly can you cycle data back to those individuals, back to those companies? And particularly when we think about the data piece, um, again, historically, certainly for the last decade or so, it's existed within the upper echelons of the industry, it's existed in the hands of quote unquote technologists, rather than trying to now move that data across to many more players within the field in particular, and be able to supercharge them with that data. If farmers have that level of data, but not just the data, they have the tools that you've already created that you can essentially allow them to plug into. And that's also very, very important. You have to work within the systems and processes they already have to be able to supercharge them, rather than wholesale either trying to upsell them something or try to give them something that is just not compatible with the way that they work. Now, if you're able to push data down the entire supply chain, we're all enriched in the way that um, we can get product to market. But we go back to the question of who controls margins and what those margins are within the industry.
we understood very early on that we had to accept rightfully a smaller margin share in terms of marking up our product in lieu of trying to have a customer base and a real community that we deliver to more often and which is why we have a membership model where our members pay $25 a month to be a member to ensure that we're building a community where we can drive down the price of um, those groceries and we can help, which is why you'll see on our platform, we can help both small and mid-sized. We're more than 50% local. So you will see large scale CPG companies on our platform. You will see a lot of local on our platform as well. You'll see coffee that's roasted right here in Oakland, for example. Um, by a company that is run by a father and son that have been in business for three years, uh, three and a half years actually, and that are, that are now on the shelves of places like Whole Foods and Rainbow, uh, Rainbow Grocery, as well as an in zero. And for a lot of these guys, th this is types of data they have never had before or they have never seen before. And if we work for them to understand what is it that you need insights to that you haven't had insights to, what will help your business to grow over competitors or legacy competitors? I think that's a very, very powerful message that uh, we were talking about the democratization of data. Um, this reminds me of a piece I read on uh, how um, grocery delivery platform Foxtrot is helping a local neighborhood um, um, grocery store, a specialty store that's called Mercado. Um, this is in New York, I believe. And it, it's also the idea of how small businesses who don't have the technical knowledge and who are also put off by the uh, technical appeal of it. Um, and then by because of that obstacle, they can't take advantage of the primacy of first party data, which we all agree on is really important right now. Uh, they can't take advantage of that uh, and that's hurting their businesses. Um, so that's where um, kind of like mission driven, um, um, tech companies come in and they create like a white label solution uh, for uh, the um, mom and pop uh, grocery stores all or consumer goods who otherwise don't have the technology. And so like if those tech companies are can share the insights to help uh, the small businesses to opera, uh, optimize their business um, operations, that has um, that that's going to uh, level help them to level up and uh, not just demise um, in this major tech disruption scene. And I think that uh, has a lot of value to it. Um, so uh, our next question um, is regarding um, brand communication. I know today we have a few uh, brand strategists, uh, so this could be interesting. The question is, do retailers uh, as well as brands have an obligation to encourage cus customers to, to change their eating habits? Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, should they act as an unbiased market platform? Um, I, I know Rob is very uh, experienced in branding strategies, as well as working with emission-driven companies. Would you like to share your idea on, on yeah, that? Yeah, I'd be happy to, thanks. Um, yeah, my perspective on this is pretty strong. I think the brands, it's a no-brainer, and I can start there in terms of whether or not they should be encouraging healthy eating and, and wellness, and this, you know, especially in any purpose-driven food business. I can't imagine one that wouldn't have a value that was primary around uh, wanting its consumers to live healthy and well lives. So that, that's pretty clear. And, um, and from an execution, you know, brands really have an opportunity to really build their brand around giving that voice, right? To uh, define a clear set of values for their company and bring them to life in their social media, on their packaging, and pretty much in everything they do, you know, matching their words and their actions. Um, you know, on the retail side, it's interesting because, you know, one could argue both sides, but I feel like they also have a moral obligation uh, to the, the, the health of their, their customers. Um, no business should be in business if what they're selling is not inherently good for you or you're not giving them enough information for how, um, how to use it appropriately, right? And that's not to say that 
um, you know, grocery stores can't sell soda or cookies or other things that maybe are high in sugar. Um, but it's also um, having uh, information available for what a balanced uh, meal looks like all day. Um, and I feel like store brands really build their brand by having that information because it really shows that they care about their consumer. Um, and, and furthermore, it helps them build, um, you know, through education, they're building uh, consumption in different lines. And so it's in their best interest, both uh, ethically uh, to do so, but also from the, you know, the bottom line of profit by building these relationships and, and, and taking a more stewarded role in that. I, I also agree that uh, the companies are having um, a feeling of push from the consumer side to um, to um, be more health driven and uh, consumer focused. Um, would you um, share um, like from your experience, uh, if not, um, if allowed, uh, what are some of the case studies um, that you've seen where the companies do an ex uh, excellent job in making the information transparent and communicating those effectively. Um, so like how to, um, trans how to create transparency, um, communicating what, what goes into uh, the ingredients. Right, right. And are, are you, you're addressing that to me, I guess, that. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I haven't seen any case studies on the retailer side. I know anecdotally that, um, you know, my mother lives in North Carolina. She goes to Harris Teeter. They have cooking classes. Um, you know, some retailers are really into this and they provide information. If you walk through the store, there's all kinds of information because what they do, and I've read this about them, um, is they really do try to educate and they try to introduce uh, new products, new vegetables, right? Um, one of the buzzy things around that goes around right now is how we try to diversify what we eat. We're not eating the same foods all the time. We try to bring in new ingredients, new uh, vegetables, new whatever into our diets and, and, and the, the health benefit of doing that. So I've seen this specifically in some retailers there. And I think, again, kind of to my earlier point, Doing so just makes good business sense because you're, you're building businesses, you're building a relationship, um, and ultimately you're doing the right thing. And so from, you know, would you think about brand strategy, um, especially one that's based on mission and values, which is what I build with my clients, um, you know, building your brand on a foundation of mission and values really has huge benefits for your customers, for your employees, for your vendor partners, like everyone who works with you is proud to work with a company that does it from a, from a mission and value standpoint, right? And so that's great brand building, but it's just also great business building. So I think, I think the evidence of doing that just makes sense. I haven't seen necessarily you know, a case study per se that says you know, from like a business result standpoint, doing that added X, or why to their bottom line or the profit, uh, but intuitively it just makes sense to me that it would. Did that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay. Uh, very interesting. I have more questions around, but uh, we have been doing most of the talking. Uh, is there anyone from uh, our audience who would like to share, uh, for example, um, what, what do you think is uh, an ingredient that you have questions uh, about whether it's healthy or not. Um, so uh, there has been a lot of debate around GMO uh, for decades of times. Um, you now, anyone has a thought on that? I see that. Just... We also just have a few people that just joined us live on Instagram. So in case you guys have any questions, just participate. Do any of the participants want to jump in on the non-GMO question? Um, so uh, I'll uh, contribute a little to, uh, uh, to keep, uh, kick a start starting. 
Um, I think GMO is a case study for uh, plant-based products. Um, we mostly, I, I think everyone in the audience agree that plant-based products are uh, good for global health uh, because of the afford affordability and uh, animal cruelty and its uh, um, power to drive down an antibiotic crisis. Um, however, um, um, it's a tech-driven product, and that can be challenging because uh, for decades of times, uh, non-GMO um, has uh, GMO products uh, has is seen still today by 45% of the consumers as something that, that have questions around if it's healthy for their bodies. Um, so I think, especially for new ingredients uh, that possibly possibly is healthy for our bodies um, if the message is not communicated in a um, in the right way consumers might not be willing to adopt it uh, so I think that's where branding and um, messaging comes into play uh, in that you want to make it make sure it's a, a smooth uh, frictionless experience for consumers to adopt um, cheap healthy uh, products that they don't have doubts about yeah i i find the gmo uh, issue interesting because um you know if you take uh impossible burger for example right and so major disruption if they're able to uh, impact the amount of animals that are slaughtered and, and grown in these horrible uh cafe situations uh, major greenhouse reduction, major environmental uh, impact reduction. Yet on the other hand, it is GMO. They've taken something from soybean or beet, I forget exactly, but they've, they've genetically modified the soybean in order for it to have a certain taste profile. Um, mm -hmm. Right, it's the, it's the heme, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, they've modified something. They've taken heme from something and added it to soybeans. And so you've got all this goodness here, but then you've got monoculture of soybean and, and the risks of all that monoculture and the impact on the environment of that monoculture. And so, you know, there, there are other GMOs too, right? That we've been modifying crops for ages and ages, but it's recently we've been modifying them in a way in, time, in certain times solely to make them more producible um, less uh, pest uh, or more pest resistant, et cetera. So we can flood them with all these crazy um, um, and, uh, pesticides, right? And make them resistant to uh, uh, Roundup and crazy stuff like that. And you're like, man, it's such, such a bad idea. Um, and so the anti-GMO and like, yeah, we don't want to make crops that are resistant to Roundup and glyphosate. Uh, in order for us to just eat cheaper food, like we, there needs to be a stop on that. So, I I feel like it's a, it to me at least personally, it's not a it's not a clear cut GMO is bad, um, but I certainly understand the origins of why people were so passionate about doing non GMO because it took us to some some bad places. Exactly, it's uh, quite a controversial um, topic even after all these years. Um, now the time is 6.30 and we have promised a secret uh, break time activity. I am uh, going to present to you uh, Rochelle who recently became a certified yoga instructor. She's also an Ari 